the stomach. So to start talking about the stomach, I'm actually going to first draw the esophagus, or color it. So the esophagus is a muscular tube that is over a foot long, it goes behind your heart, and then pierces the diaphragm where it joins up with the stomach. But right before it joins up with the stomach, it has to pass through a strong sphincter muscle sphincter muscle is a circular muscle called the lower esophageal sphincter or the LES. And this was the esophagus. The esophagus pushes the bolus down to the stomach. Using a rhythmic contraction called peristalsis. So this lower esophageal sphincter can be an issue for a lot of people. Um, so its purpose is to prevent too much food from entering the stomach at one time. And um, it can be too loose sometimes. And if it is too relaxed, then acidic, acidic stomach contents can actually go back up the esophagus and the esophagus is not designed for an acidic environment so it can burn um, and that's what we call at gastric um, reflux. So a couple of things can make it too relaxed. It can be hormonal or it can be mechanical. A hormonal example is um, during pregnancy, even from the beginning of pregnancy, there's a hormone known as relaxin that is meant to help joints loosen and relax for the eventual delivery of the baby. But what they can cause is a little bit of heartburn or gastric reflux even early in a pregnancy if this muscle is too relaxed. So pregnancy could be a cause of that. And then later in the pregnancy, there can be a mechanical cause. As the belly gets so big, it makes the stomach have less and less room in the abdomen, and then that can actually force um, some uh, stomach contents to go back up again and cause that burning sensation. So pregnancy via relaxin, and then, and then later just from the large belly. And so then that large belly is also associated with someone that's overweight and specifically overweight in the belly. Uh, and so this can put mechanical pressure on the stomach. And then a really large meal even can, um, can cause uh, some contents to come back up again. Okay, then there can also be another, an opposite problem that's not as common, but it's interesting to mention. My dad actually had this, and it's called achalasia. And achalasia is when the LES is over constricted, it's too tight and it doesn't relax and it doesn't let the bolus of food come down to the stomach and so what can actually happen is the food piles up here and it's unable to enter the stomach and it piles and it piles and becomes very very painful and in my dad's case what happened was that he actually became quite underweight because he could never eat very much at a meal because he couldn't get the food into his stomach and it was too painful so the treatment for this was really cool. They um, put him under and they put basically a balloon down here and then they inflated the balloon in this part of his esophagus and just ripped the muscle. But interestingly, he's had some rebound of his symptoms in later years and 
um, I have wondered if it's that the muscle fibers are trying to grow back again or if maybe they weren't all properly um, opened up to begin with. So you can have too relaxed LES or too tight, and either way it's going to make you very uncomfortable, either before, during, or after a meal. Then there's a similar kind of sphincter muscle at the bottom of the stomach. And this one is called the pyloric sphincter. And its job is to prevent food from leaving the stomach before it is fully um, mixed up in a uniform mixture we call chyme and that, that has a low pH. So contents that leave the stomach need to be uniformly mixed and they need to be um, have gotten to a low enough pH to have activated uh, pepsin, which we'll talk about next. Okay, so the stomach is covered with wrinkles and that is what allows it to expand. And it can, can hold quite a bit of food and then it has to mix all of that food uniformly. And we'll use some different colors to talk about some of the things that are uh, released into the stomach. So uh, one uh, substance that enters the stomach from the stomach walls is called pepsinogen. And another substance, and we'll come back to these in a second, is um, hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid will lower um, the pH of the stomach and activate pepsinogen into its active form, which is called pepsinogen. So basically hydrochloric acid a hydrochloric acid um, enzymatically, um, or it doesn't, it's not an enzymatic reaction actually, but it chops off the um, inactive form, releasing the active pepsin. So that's one reason we need hydrochloric acid. And then the other reason is that the low pH provided by hydrochloric acid inhibits most foodborne pathogens that would make you ill. So interestingly, this is just an idea to ponder, but if the more protein you have in your meal, the lower the um, acidity of the stomach because you need more hydrochloric acid to activate more pepsin to start the protein digestion, I wonder if there is any correlation then with um, in a further inhibition of um, foodborne illness. In other words, if there is adequate amount of protein in the meal, does that decrease the possibility of um, getting ill from a foodborne illness as opposed to if the meal was like purely carbohydrate. I, I, don't, I don't know, but it's something to think about. Now, um, one exception of bacteria that um, actually likes to live and colonize the stomach is uh, H. pylori, so helicobacter pylori, and it likes to live in the pylorus region right here that word pylorus means gateway, and it's right before the pyloric sphincter. Um, so H, back, or heli, we'll, we'll write out the whole name, helicobacter pylori. And it's now known that in um, many cases, ulcers are caused by this bacteria.
Okay, so I'm going to actually take a break um, and then I'm gonna come back and go through the rest of the stomach lecture, um, some more ingredients in the stomach.